Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're uh, watching this virtual presentation. Uh, my name is Alex Kirkop, and I'm one of the co-chairs for the CNCF storage tag. Um, and my co-presenters, Xing and Raffaele. Hi, Alex. Uh, my name is Xing Yang. I work at VMware in the cloud storage team. I'm a co-chair of Kubernetes Six Storage and also a co-chair of the CNCF Tech Storage. Now it's uh, Rafael's turn to introduce himself. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rafael Spassoli. I work at Red Hat as an OpenShift architect. And I also uh, help in the storage tag as a tech lead. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. So. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this uh, storage uh, tag presentation. Um, we're going to be talking today um, to cover a, a wide variety of topics, but we want to cover um, what the tag does and, and, and how you can join in and, and help. Um, we work a lot with a number of the storage projects in the CNCF, so we'll cover the projects that we work with and the um, and the ones which are being reviewed. Um, we'll also, uh, as part of the tag, we're, we'll also prepare um, a number of different documents. So we'll cover uh, off some of the three documents that we've been working on um, this year, including the storage landscape documents, the um, performance and benchmarking, and our cloud native disaster recovery documents, which I all hope you'll find very interesting. So as a quick intro, um, to the TAG. The TAG stands for Technical Advisory Group, and they were uh, renamed from the SIGs earlier this year. Um, we renamed the, the CNCF SIGs, were, were renamed primarily to avoid confusion with the Kubernetes SIGs. Um, the TAG is um, fully open, and, and, and everything we do is, uh, is public. Um, our meeting uh, agendas are minuted and our conference calls are open every uh, every two weeks on the second and fourth Wednesday of, of every month. Um, we'd love to um, we'd love to uh, have more people from the community join us, um, whether you're from a vendor or from a project or even just an individual uh, contributor, everybody is um, welcome. Um, and all of our recordings of previous meetings are, are available too. So who are we? Um, the tag is formed from a diverse set of users and developers uh, of, of with a cloud native uh, and storage focus. Um, we're obviously trying to um, lead and promote the cloud native storage uh, technologies within within the community. We have uh, a number of uh, co-chairs who help uh, with the coordination of the tag and a number of um, tech leads who act as uh, subject matter experts in their in their field um, and provide uh, advice and and uh, work on the different projects and together with with uh, with our coaches and leads and the community in the tag we work with the TOC um, via our liaisons who uh, are Sadali and and Aaron Boyd both of which were um, previous members of the tag too um, so what do we do what's the key uh, purpose of the tag. The tag is there to help scale the 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 TOC, right? So so the the, the main function for us is is to help provide um, education to um, our end users in, in the form of um, white papers and and documents and um, work on the projects uh, and review projects and provide guidance on to to the projects for the for the TOC um, and primarily act as as an extension. <clears throat> of the TOC for uh, for the technical subject matter that uh, that we're focusing on in the storage space. Now, when we say storage, it's actually uh, pretty broad. So it's it's not just um, you know things like uh, file systems or volumes, but includes uh, things like uh, databases and object stores and, and and key value stores too. So some of the things that we've built uh, over over the last couple of years is um, some some material that helps with 
uh, informing developers, DevOps teams, and, and everybody who consumes cloud native uh, products and cloud native ecosystems um, on how to 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 best make use of the of the technology. Because you know what we're what we're realizing is that uh, more and more we're seeing uh, developers take advantage of of these technologies, and uh, and it's it's very important for. Um, for the end users to that are consuming um, the different types of cloud native storage to be able to understand the different uh, attributes of, of those of those systems and and how they and how they interact and and Jing will be talking a little bit about that in uh, when she covers uh, the storage white paper in a couple of minutes. The second thing that we do um, with the TOC is we help with the process of moving projects um, into the CNCF ecosystem. So in the CNCF, we have uh, three types of projects. We have sandbox incubation and graduation, where sandbox uh, projects are, are have a low barrier to entry. And the idea is that it, we, they use the CNCF as a way of building out their community and ecosystem. Um, incubation projects are, are projects that have gotten to a good level of maturity and have proven um, their use in production uh, in a number of uh, end users and and have healthy number of committers and, uh, and and project roadmap. And then finally, graduation is for is for um, the most mainstream um, production use uh, pro projects. You know, and includes things like uh, Kubernetes, for example, and and, and Prometheus. Um, and graduated projects also benefit from um, additional levels of maturity, like security aud audits, and, and, and have some future proofing in terms of uh, making sure that there are multiple organizations that are supporting them. And so, you know, as part of the um, as part of the TOC, um, uh, as part of the help that we provide to the TOC. Um, we often see presentations from different projects and we help with the due diligence reviews um, to, to either move to incubation or, or graduation. Um, so some of, some of the time um, we'll be just doing discovery and outreach to, to Canada projects and, and other times we're specifically helping the, the, the TOC and working with a member of the TOC, a sponsor from the TOC to, to actually um, review the projects. One of the, one of the important points is that, you know, we, we operate in a consultative mode and, and ultimately the TOC um, have the have the final say in in, in every decision, um, and once the TOC has voted on on those projects, it goes to a public vote for for um, for a final review. Of course, you know the other thing is we would be nothing without the end users and the community. Um, so we we try our best in the in the in the way of um, uh, surveys, but also you know reach out in in these sort of virtual events to to gather your input and feedback and um, and understand try and understand what's best uh, what what are the best things we can do to help the community and we're we're actually just going through a planning phase right now and definitely if you have input and you have things that you'd like to work with us um, or you'd like us to work on please provide that input either to the mailing list or by joining one of our calls i talked a little bit about um about the the sort of expert advisor status that we hold with the with the toc where we help with with um, the due diligence for reviewing projects, but we also periodically check in with with some of those projects and um, and, and do reviews on on their health, etc. But again, as always, in all cases, um, the TOC will make the final decisions on those on those projects. Um, so now I'd like to hand over to Xing, who will talk a little bit about. Um, some of the projects uh, that uh, that we focus on in the storage space for the CNCF. Shing? Thanks, Alex. I'm going to talk about graduated and incubating CNCF projects. Rook is a graduated project. Rook is an open source cloud native storage orchestrator for Kubernetes. Rook turns the distributed storage systems into self-managing, self-scaling, and self-healing storage services. Rook supports multiple 
storage solutions, each with a specialized Kubernetes operator to automate management. It has stable support for Ceph and alpha support for Cassandra and NFS. Vitas is a graduated project. Vitas is a database clustering system for horizon horizontal scaling of MySQL. Currently, Vitas supports MySQL, Procrena, and MariaDB databases. It combines and extends many important SQL features with the scalability of a NoSQL database. ETCD is a graduated project. It's a distributed key value store that provides a reliable way to store data across a cluster of machines. All Kubernetes clusters use ETCD as their primary data store. It handles storing and replicating data for Kubernetes cluster state and uses the raft consensus algorithm to recover from hardware failure and network partitions. TechAV is a graduated project. TechAV is an open source distributed transactional key value database built in Rust. It provides transactional key value APIs with ACID guarantees. The project provides a unifying distributed storage layer for cloud native applications. It can also be deployed on top of Kubernetes with an operator. Dragonfly is an incubating project. It is also a project under SIG Runtime. Dragonfly is an open source P2P based cloud native image and file distribution system. It was originally created to improve the user experience with application cache log image distributions at very large scales. For Dragonfly, no matter how many clients start the file downloading, the average downloading time is almost stable without performance penalties. We also have Longhorn, which just became an incubating project. Longhorn is a distributed log storage system for Kubernetes. It is built using Kubernetes and container primitives. Longhorn creates a dedicated storage controller for each block device volume and synchronously replicates the volume across multiple replicas stored on multiple nodes. That's all for the CNCF storage projects. Next slide, please. Here are a few projects that are in review for incubation. Next, please. Now I'm going to, um, uh, and, and here are a list of the other storage projects in CNCF. And there are a few more sandbox projects shown here. Next, please. I will talk about the CNCF storage landscape white paper. In this white paper, we described storage system attributes, different layers in a storage solution and how they affect the storage attributes. We talked about the definition of uh, data access interfaces and uh, management interfaces. Next, please. Storage systems have several storage attributes, availability, scalability, performance, consistency, and durability. Availability defines the ability to access the data during failure conditions. Scalability can be measured by the ability to scale the number of clients, throughput, or number of operations, the capacity, and the number of components. Performance can be measured against latency, the number of operations per second, and the throughput. Consistency refers to the ability to access newly created data or updates after it has been committed. A system can be either eventual consistent or strongly consistent. Durability is affected by the data protection layers, level of uh, redundancy, the endurance of the storage media and the ability to detect corruption and recover the data. Next, please. There are several storage layers that can impact the storage attributes. For example, rather than directly access resources, a hypervisor can provide access to resources, which could add access overhead. Storage topology describes the arrangement of storage and compute resources and the data link between them. 
This include centralized, distributed, sharded, and hyper-converged topologies. Storage systems usually have data protection layer, which adds redundancy. This refers to RAID, erasure coding, and replicas. Storage systems usually provide data services in addition to the core storage functions, including replication, snapshots, clones, and so on. Storage system ultimately persists data on physical storage layer, which is usually non-volatile. It has impact on overall performance and long-term durability. Next, please. Uh, in this diagram, you can see that the workloads consume storage through different data access interfaces. There are two categories of data access interfaces here. We call them volumes and API. Container orchestration system has interfaces for volumes, which supports both block and file systems. In Kubernetes, there are two volume modes, file system and block. File system mode allows workloads to consume file system directly. Underneath, it can be either file or block interface. Block mode allows raw block device to be consumed directly by the workload. On the API, we have object store API that stores or retrieves objects. Note that there is a Kubernetes SIG storage subproject called COSI container object storage interface, which introduces Kubernetes APIs to support orchestration of object store operations for Kubernetes workloads. It also introduces COSI as a set of uh, gRPC interfaces so that a object storage vendor can write a driver for provisioning accessing object stores. It is targeting alpha in Kubernetes 1.23 release. On the API, we also have key value stores that uses an API to store retrieve values from stores based on a key. It is typically used to store state configuration or distributed systems. On the API, we also have databases. Databases are typically accessed through an API. Note that all databases are not all databases are uh, cloud native. This can typically be addressed with additional tooling like the use of proxies and orchestration systems that allow them to be better suited to run in a cloud native environment. Next, please. Now let's look at orchestration and management interfaces. This diagram shows workloads consume storage through data access interfaces. There are two ways for storage systems to interact with container orchestration systems. The darker green box here, control plane interfaces refer to storage interfaces directly supported by SEALs, including container storage interface, CSI, darker volume driver interface, and so on. CSI has three gRPC services, controller, node, and identity services. Identity service provides info and capabilities of a plugin. Control service supports functions such as create and delete volume, attach and detach volume, and so on. Node service supports functions such as mount and unmount volume. The orange box here is called a frameworks and tools. This is an extension of control plane interfaces. For application API, including key value store and databases, CEOs currently don't have direct interfaces for it yet. But some frameworks and tools have support for them. For example, Rook supports Cassandra. Vitas has an operator to manage MySQL clusters. So that's all for the storage landscape white paper. Now I will hand it over to Alex to talk about the performance white paper. Brilliant, thanks, Xing. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about um, the performance white paper. When we were looking at the, the landscape in the storage space, um, and we categorized those different um, those different uh, attributes, one of the one of the key attributes that we wanted to also cover um, in further detail was was performance and. Then later on, things like data protection and disaster recovery, which, which Raffaele will cover next. But in the performance white paper, what we're trying to do is, is to provide 
um, some information to help people uh, understand the the concepts for how you measure performance. Um, and we focused on two main areas, one for volumes and the second for databases. We'll probably add um, additional uh, additional uh, areas in, in future. But right now we focused on, on volumes in terms of, you know, some of the things that we'd want to look at, like um, the latency or the the number of operations or the the number the the, the throughput for those volumes um, and then also databases in terms of you know things like the uh, the transaction overheads but of course um, also the the um, functions like uh, latency and um, and other benchmarks related to um, transactional reads and 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 writes within within an environment. One of the key things that we found when we were um, going through this with with a number of uh, with a number of people from the tag was that there's there's a number of um, there's a number of uh, different uh, misconceptions when it comes to um, managing, uh, when it comes to benchmarking, especially when it comes to doing apples for apples um, comparisons. So, so we actually spent quite a bit of time defining some of the common pitfalls and, and other considerations that are, um, that are important in understanding their impact on the performance of the system. So at a very basic level, for example, differentiating between the number of operations versus the number of versus the, the, the throughput based on um, you know other other factors within within the test. So for example, um, if you're test if you want to test um, the number of operations for lots of little objects or, or smaller um, block sizes versus, for example, throughput, where you, you might want to be testing with um, larger block sizes and and factors like um, uh, and, 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 and factors like uh, concurrency too. The the other the other aspect that which is which is really important is you know the data services which again Jing talked on in, in, in those different layers and, and how they affect the, the performance. So um, in understanding the the topology, whether it's you know hyperconverged or or centralized or accessed over a network or being local, is is obviously key because the latency um, from the topology definitely affects almost every aspect of of performance. But of course, you know the methods which are used for data protection, whether it's things like erasure code or or, or, or replicas, for example. Um, the compression algorithms that might be used in, in data reduction and, and things like thin provisioning, um, but also the overheads used to protect the data, like uh, in encryption. Um, and in all of these, in all of these um, factors, you know, there are also some more complicated uh, things that that come into play. So, for example, understanding the the different queue depths, but also making sure that. The bottlenecks um, aren't happening. The, 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 when you're trying to measure bottlenecks, that they aren't happening in the the clients or in the backends, right? So it's trying to understand um, those those factors. One of the key key things is the caching element, um, and certainly the the easiest downfall that we've seen in multiple times is making sure um, that the size of your workload ma matches. Um, matches the, the the caching capabilities of your system. So, for example, you know the, we've seen many many times um, uh, benchmarks uh, revealing numbers where the 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 results um, far exceed the capabilities of the storage system, or whether that's a volume or a database, and and that's typically because um, the workload is smaller than the size of the cache and therefore in reality the the, the benchmark is, is really only testing the speed of the cache rather than the speed of the um of the storage system of course with all of these things managing the environment and understanding the headroom in your environment is also key so in summary the the, the important takeaway is don't um don't use published results because they're very uh, rarely useful for for making comparisons. It's extremely hard to compare the published results in, a, in an apples to apples way um, without 
uh, a deep understanding of, of the test conditions. And we would always recommend that you run your own tests on your own applications within your own environment, because that's really the only way that, um, that you're going to be able to get uh, a, a real life representation of, of, uh, of, what you want, of what you'll be able to achieve uh, in your own environment. The performance uh, document is is still open for a review, and we'd love to hear your input uh, on this, and and maybe um, have uh, any suggestions. We'd would would love to hear from you. And now I'll hand over to Raffaele, who's going to cover cloud native disaster recovery, which is the latest uh, white paper we've been working on. Thank you, Alex, uh, <clears throat> and thanks everybody for coming today. This. Um, uh, white paper is um, in this white paper we submit to your attention the the concept of cloud native disaster recovery. It's an approach to organizing your disaster recovery strategy and uh, for, for for applications for your applications. And uh, uh, we think it's 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 an alternative to more traditional disaster recovery approaches. It's it's something that cloud native uh, cloud native uh, best practices uh, enable today and and i think it's something you should consider i think it's something you should consider it's not always going to be the best approach but it, it should be something you know about and it's in your toolbox and when it, when it's the right thing to do you know how to do it but but what is cloud native disaster recovery um, let's define it using this table and comparing it with more traditional disaster recovery and, and by traditional disaster recovery here we mean um, what you find in uh, large enterprises in large traditional enterprises not the web scaler not maybe the unicorn startups but really um, normal enterprises so let's go um, line by line uh, um, we will cover the uh, this this table really quickly right the the first uh, differences in the type of deployment for your workloads. Uh, normally what you find, especially for stateful workloads, which is the, obviously it's the objective here, it's a scope for tag storage, but stateful workloads, we, what, we all, what we usually find is an active passive type of deployment. Rarely we find uh, companies that have the ability to do active active across data centers or across regions with cloud native disaster recovery, uh, we say that you have to you you do active active. We we do active active with cloud native disaster recovery. Another difference is how do we detect that we are in a disaster situation? With disaster recovery, uh, traditional disaster recovery, you, usually the decision is made by a human. It's a human decision. Uh, you know, there is a maybe an emergency room or a, you know, or a situation room where many people are. Uh, are meeting and uh, somebody says, okay, we are really in a disaster. We need to trigger the disaster recovery decision. Uh, we need to trigger the disaster recovery procedure. Um, in cloud native disaster recovery, the software needs to realize that there is a problem and, and trigger the DR procedure automatically or autonomously. And then the procedure itself in traditional disaster recovery, it's usually a mix of manual and automated tasks. Like I said, the trigger is definitely manual. Maybe the rest is automated depending on your maturity. That is the thing that you that actually this uh, com many companies test maybe once a year or a couple of times a year, right? Um, but uh, in cloud native disaster recovery, uh, uh, everything must be absolutely automated. And then the two main metrics by which you measure your SLA for disaster recovery, which are RTO, recovery time objective, and RPO. They respectively measure the downtime of your service and how back in time you go, um, the, the amount of data loss, the amount of data loss measured in time, the, the amount of transactions that were lost because of the disaster. So for, uh, for the downtime in traditional disaster recovery, you can have from close to zero to hours, depending how, how good you have organized, how well you have organized your, your uh, workloads, for cloud native disaster recovery, uh, it's going to be close to zero. And it really, we cannot have zero because there are some health checks that need to trigger and traffic need, needs to be redirected to 
to the healthy locations, but it's really, in, we measure it in, in a matter of seconds. And for RPO, so the data loss, um, in traditional disaster recovery, you can have close from zero to two hours, again, depending which approach you adopt. And in cloud native disaster recovery, it's going to be zero if you use strongly consistent workloads and um, something that is theoretically unbounded, but on in normal situations, very close to zero for eventual consistent deployments. And then moving a little bit out of the uh, technical aspects and talking about organizations and ownership uh, concerns, disaster recovery uh, is, is formally owned by the application team, but in reality, in many traditional um, organic, many traditional enterprises, what this application team do, they, they turn around, talk to the storage team and ask what kind of SLA can you provide for storage? And then whatever the storage team answer, that's also, that that's what also is adopted by the application team. So essentially the storage team uh, drives the disaster recovery. Um, for everybody, for, for all the applications. In in cloud native disaster recovery, in cloud native disaster recovery, the, the application team is clearly the owner of, of, of the uh, disaster recovery process and they have to pick the right uh, middleware, the right storage component to be able to uh, to be able to perform the disaster recovery the way they need. And then another thing that we found actually creating this cloud native uh, disaster recovery infrastructure is that for traditional DR, um, the capabilities to uh, that enable us to build these uh, disaster recovery procedures, uh, architectures and procedures are coming from storage, typically in the form of backup and restore or volume replication, whether sync synchronous or asynchronous. But in cloud native disaster recovery, the capabilities that we need come mostly from networking. And it, they are in the form of east-west communication, by which we mean the ability of our data centers of our region to communicate horizontally, so east-west, and uh, in the form of a global balance. So something that uh, sits in front of our uh, data centers or our, our regions and spreads the traffic under normal circumstances, but when there is a disaster, is able to realize that one of the failure domain is not available and redirects the traffic to the available and healthy failure domain. Next slide, please. So in this white paper, we I wanna cover a little bit what, what you can find inside of it. Um, there is this definition, high level definition. Then we have a section with some um, theoretical content that supports the definition and gives you evidence that these architectures can actually be built. Uh, so you can find some body of knowledge on, on why it's possible to, be, to build this architecture and a lot of links on if you want to go deeper. And so you, you find things like definition of failure domain, uh, high availability disaster recovery, and then the CAP theorem and everything that comes with it and then um, a description or an anatomy of um, how distributed workloads are organized in, with respect to being uh, fault tolerant and manage, uh, being able to manage uh, replicas and shards. And then we talk about consensus protocols, which is what allows all of the, the instances of this distributed workload to, to coordinate with, it, with each other. And then in the final part of the uh, white paper, we uh, have some reference architectures on uh, on this um, cloud native disaster recovery approach. In, in particular, we have two architectures for strongly consistent workloads uh, or deployments and eventual consistent deployments. Next slide, please. So this is an example of uh, the kind of research that you can find inside this white paper. For example, here we have a, a list of uh, products that can be uh, utilized to and deployed in a cloud native disaster recovery uh, fashion. Um, so, so maybe I should premise that not all of the workloads, state of workloads can be used this, uh, this way, right? You need to pick the right middleware. 
uh, we give you some criteria on what what to look for but and then this there is this list it's not meant to crown kings it's just a set of um, a set of uh, products that we have analyzed and as you can see we in this table we show what uh, is the replica uh, the consensus protocol used for replicas and paxos and rafts are, are the most popular and then what is the consensus protocol used for synchronizing inter uh, shared transactions next slide and this is an example of the reference architecture uh, in this case it's a reference architecture for a kubernetes deployment and for a strongly consistent workload and so here if you can see my pointer we have the workload the stateful workload this could be a database could be a key value store could be a cache as you, as you can see, we have several data centers, at least three. The, the workloads needs to be able to sync its state, and that's that's the east-west communication I was talking about. Probably you will have a front end in front of it, a uh, stateless front end. Probably you'll have some kind of ingress to get traffic into the clusters, and there is a global balancer in front of the workload. When, when a region goes down, for example, let's say data center one here goes down, uh, the workloads will realize it with self-organized, uh, maybe by creating uh, more replicas in the, in the remaining regions. And then this, at the same time, the global load balancer using health checks will see that one of the, the, um, one of the data centers is not available anymore and redirect the traffic to the healthy location. Overall, you you don't lose any data and the client may experience some hiccups but in general um, if they have a good retrying mechanism they will just continue working uh, another aspect that we look at when we do this reference architecture is what happens if uh, the ingress traffic is is working correctly but the east-west traffic is somehow interrupted and that's, uh, that's really what is called a network partitioning in the CAP theorem. And so we want to make sure that uh, uh, we analyze and we describe what happens if, if a network partitioning uh, happens. Uh, for example, for uh, strongly consistent workloads, if a network partition happens, the, the, uh, because of the um, quorum and leader election protocol, quorum requirements and leader, leader election protocol, the part, the, the partition that doesn't have the majority of instances will essentially consider itself offline and and start behaving as as not available and so you will have a, the same behavior that happens when there is a disaster and so uh, traffic will go to the healthy location and uh, again the the clients will not experience an interruption of service or a, an inconsistent behavior um, because of the the state is never uh, it never drifts into inconsistent, uh, inconsistent split, split brain scenarios. And I think that's it for the cloning DDR white paper. So back to you, Alex. Brilliant. Thank you, Raffaele. Um, and I think with that, that ends our uh, our presentation. Um, we'd like to remind you that if you want to get involved, do feel free to join uh, our meeting, uh, which which is uh, on the second and fourth Wednesday um, of every month. Um, we have a um, we have a, a, our GitHub repo, which which contains uh, all the links to um, our meeting requests, uh, our meeting minutes, I mean, and our recordings. And again, to remind you, you know, if you're interested at all in how you manage storage, uh, things like block stores, file systems, uh, object stores, key value stores, databases, um, and all the topics uh, around that related to things like performance and disaster recovery and uh, and scalability of, of cloud native environments. We'd love to hear from you uh, and everybody is welcome. So thanks again, and we're happy to answer your questions now. <laughs>